and welcome back to my channel. Unless you're new here, and then just welcome. My name is Rusty, and this is my channel where I talk about my favorite movies, mostly horror, and my favorite music, mostly metal. And welcome to day five of my Battle Royale Festival, and let the games begin. And may the odds be ever in your favor. We are going to talk about Kill Theory. Now, Kill Theory is in the fourth collection of the eight films to die for, the After Dark Horror Fest. It is a battle royale. It was released in 2009. It was directed by Chris Moore, a name you should be familiar with, and was written by Kelly C. Palmer. It stars Don McManus, Ryan Dusich, and Teddy Dunn. And I think probably the person you would recognize the most would be Taryn Manning. Now, Taryn Manning plays the really short trailer hillbilly girl in um, Orange is the New Black. So she's in this movie, and uh, she's really cool in this movie, and that's immediately where I recognized her from. So Kill Theory is a little battle royale. We are introduced to Dr. Terfin Tafrin, and um, he is being he is interviewing um, his last session with a patient in a psych ward whom is up for release this guy um, had a mountain climbing accident in which he was with his three friends and they were all climbing this mountain I won't even go into what I think about mountain climbing but he was um, which is the same thing I think about all those adrenaline rush sports or activities spitting in the face of death but um, he was doing that with his three friends. They were, you know, very, very high up, and something happened. And he basically was the top of the rope, and the rope was breaking to save his own life. He cut the rope and listened as his three friends screamed to their deaths at the bottom of the mountain. So, he was convicted of uh, second-degree manslaughter for doing that. He, of course, doesn't agree with this and has uh, said and done what he could to earn his release from this psychiatric facility. So, he is being released, and um, you get to see this last little tete-a-tete -tete between the doctor and him you know, yes, I know it was wrong, yes, I've changed my mind, I, you know, because the doctor was like, you know, when you first came in here, you were claiming that no one, that no one would make any different choice than what you did, so you refused to accept responsibility that what you did was wrong, yeah, well, I've changed my mind, of course, you know, there are options, there should have been other options, I don't really think there was, but you know, and neither does he, as we'll find out. So they let, you know, him out. He's got to continue the year-long, uh, another year of, of outpatient therapy, and they let him go. So this is where we then, you know, intro our pretty people in peril. We have the group of... My light is not very bright. Um, we have Brent, Freddie, Amber, Jennifer, Michael, Nicole, and Carlos. Plus, when they get there, they're going to this cabin on the lake. So this is sort of like a cabin on the lake slasher. This is the other of this group that is really high on the slasher battle royale side of things 
So um, when they do arrive there, Brent's stepsister, Alex, who is played by that girl from Orange is the New Black, um, so there she arrives. She's already there. So they, this group arrives, you know, it's the usual Friday the 13th, get to know the, our, our, our people in peril. And, um, obviously Brent and Alex, um, don't get along. You know, his father is married to her mother, so they're not blood related. You have the typical games and banter and Carlos ends up passing out on the porch um, that first night uh, when Nicole came out there and they were going to make out. This group does seem to not mind just like having sex with each other wherever they want to and don't really care who comes along and sees. But um, in the process of that, he, you know, Carlos passes out and we see Nicole grabbed by the mysterious figure. So Nicole is uh, Nicole is grabbed, and next thing you know, um, who is that? Freddy is asleep on the couch when all of a sudden her body comes through the window, crashes in on him, like you know, tossed in, and he of course freaks out. Everybody comes running. They see her. She's dead, and she's got all of these weird cuts and words, you know, does or symbols like cut onto her. And um, Carlos, of course, is freaking out because he was passed out right there. Um, the last thing he would have remembered was them making out. And then all of a sudden, this shit's going on. So um, she crashes through the window. All of them come running, at which uh, point they see a video monitor that wasn't there. And a little tape. Of course, this is a battle royale. So they look at the tape, and the tape shows Nicole being forced to hold a gun um, over Carlos while he was passed out on the porch. And this mysterious voice is telling her to, you got, you know, this is your choice. You can kill him, or you can die yourself. She, of course, refuses and also turns around and tries to pull, you know, use it on the killer he of course then you're it shows her being dragged off somewhere where she is brutally murdered and stabbed slashed and stabbed so once they witness this they are then told um you know after she refuses to kill she's killed um the killer shows um the killer then shows a picture of his friend. So we know who this is. There's no mystery about who this is. It's the guy from the psych ward. So he shows a picture of his three friends on this video. The ones he cut loose. And he even tells them the story. We went mountain climbing. If, you, if, if anyone had ever even suggested that I would hurt my friends before this moment. I would have told them they were crazy. Then this incident occurred, and I did what I had to do to survive. So he shows that, and he talks about it, and says that, you know, he would never have killed, but he did, um, and was convicted of this crime because he was told that he had some options, which he doesn't believe that he had any options, but okay. So... Surprise, surprise, you all are now in this situation. There's no, there's no wireless, there's no contact, and here you are. When 6 a.m. rolls around, if more than one of you is alive, I w you will all be killed. So, they look at the clock, and it's 3 a.m. So, they have basically got three hours to figure out what the fuck to do. So, he had basically let them in on the game. This is what it is. You've got three hours to decide what the fuck to do. So, they, of course, you know, freak out. What are we going to do? All of the stuff that you would expect. Um, the killer... 
you, you know, you hear the killer doing occasional ca- taunts throughout the movie and fucking with them, um, sowing distrust between them. They discuss their options and plans. Um, it was that Brant and Carlos ended up like running to the lake in one scene, which was very good. Um, and they can't get into this little lockbox that had a gun in it. Um, that's when Carlos notices an axe over there, you know, and so he runs over there to grab this axe, at which part point he steps into, I guess what you could only describe as a full body bear trap. You know, I mean, this isn't for your leg. This is for your full body. And it snaps on him right at his waistline. So he's in this giant bear trap. Very painful, very bloody. Uh, Brent runs over, tries to help him, uh, tries to get the bear trap off of him. He's still alive, tries to get him out of it. But he hears a click and a rustle in the bushes, so he knows that killer is standing there. So he he leaves him there, alive. Um, And he goes back and tells them, you know, where's Carlos? Oh, well, he got into a trap, uh, stepped into a full body bear trap and he died and I had to leave him there so Jennifer and Mike they are a couple and they don't and Mike also used to date Amber who is Brant's boyfriend so it's that kind of thing so they don't trust Brant um, and you see them all waiting around nervously in the living room Fred of course he's the you know how you know what these are like slasher movies you have your groups and you have the geek and the jock and the cheerleader and the the quiet girl and the and the nerd and the and the fat guy so freddy's the fat guy uh the fat virgin so he's of course tweaking cuz you know those are always the ones that are going to tweak out the worst so he's really getting freaked out when all of a sudden while they're sitting there Carlos is thrown up against the front door and the killer actually bandaged him up and he's still alive. And so that freaks them all out and they're all trying to help Carlos and don't know what to do. They come to the conclusion that they must try for the van. You know, and of course they're... One good thing about the writing in this movie is that they don't really do any of the stupid decisions um, that you normally see in a slasher. As a matter of fact, when they do make what we know to be a stupid decision, they know it's a stupid decision. They just don't have any other option, and they make that very clear. So I, I really like that about this movie is that the stuff that normally you would go, oh, and roll your eyes at, they already know that going for the van, this has all been set up. Do you really think that the killer hasn't planned for everything? But they have no choice, right? I mean, what else are they going to do? So I like the way that they announce that when they do do whatever it is that they're going to do. They say, I know this is stupid. I know this can't possibly work. I know that this stupid ass psycho has fixed it but what else are we going to do so that was pretty cool writing in my opinion about this movie but um so they do try for the van they get in it it cranks wow they take off and start you know going down the road and of course a big spike trip strip comes up across the, the road and the driveway, and it flattens all four tires. And there they are stuck. When all of a sudden he comes on, you know, the little walkie, the little ham that they've got with them, and tells them, hey, you know, good try. <laughs> uh, stupid, but, you know, what could you do, right? Um, and he tells them that that was a good try, but it wasn't going to work, and that they should probably get back in the house and get on to business, you know. Um, and to hurry them along, he said, you know, as punishment, one of you must be thrown outside the van. So right now, y'all have to make a decision. 
and um, they pick Carlos. It's a very, it's a very difficult scene because it's very sad. But they pick Carlos. Well, you know, he's fixing to die. He's already very badly damaged. So you know, we're all healthy. You know, throw the half dead guy out there. That is like really sad. Um, and to give extra incentive, they hear a big splash on the roof. And that's because, you know, he knew where they were going to be flattened. And he has big giant bags of gasoline. So there's, he drops a big bag of gasoline on the truck, uh, on the van. And he's like, you've got 30 seconds. And then he drops another big, and, you know, one of them sticks their finger up there, and it's like, oh, it's gasoline. Oh, shit. So he's like, you know, either throw someone out to their death, or I'm fixing to burn you all alive. So they end up throwing Carlos out there, and he manages to get up off the ground and is, like, begging them to let him back in at the window when he is, like, debrained. He's definitely unalived. <laughs> so that was actually really really sad and grotesque you know that kill so he's going to burn the van uh, the van Brant talks them into getting rid of Carlos um, Alex she jumps out now after all of this shit she says she's a biker bitch so she's got her her ride right over there so she gets out and goes for her bike uh, the rest of them all sort of split. Uh, Brent goes his own way. The Mike and Freddie and, you know, Freddie, he hauls ass. He was the first one back at the house, too, and he's the fat boy. You know? They can move when they want to. So uh, Mike and Jen, they go back to the house. Brent is actually caught out in the woods. Like I said, Alex tries to get to her bike where she's immediately beat the shit out of. Um, and then Brent, he comes uh, running up closely to her when he is grabbed by the killer. And the killer is like, got a big axe and like cuts him across the throat with the axe. And is like, you need to get your shit in gear. Time's running out. And lets him go. We'll find out why later. So this is where Brent shows his true colors like he hasn't already. But he ends up killing his stepsister. Ugly. At the lake. Drowning her. Beating her in the head. Drowning her. So he ends up killing Alex. Um, he then goes back to the house. Where he mind fucks Fred. Freddy. Into getting the gun from Mike. Because Mike's got that gun. So he ends up. You know mind fucking him gaslighting him into get the gun from him because i me and we can go get to the boat and he's like but i thought you said the boat was sunk it was but nobody saw that but carlos who's now dead and brent so brent convinces freddie that they'll all get away on the boat if he can just get control again and to get control he's got to get that gun so that actually works, and um, Freddy does manage to get the gun from Mike. Um, there's a big showdown between Fred and you know, and everybody once he has the gun because that boy is just completely flipping out. He ends up, you know, all of his underlying aggressions and transgressions you know i'm the fat virgin kid and y'all are the all super cool jocks y'all just have me around to make fun of me you know the kind of stuff that's going to be said once you have the power of the gun so he ends up getting the angriest at brent and ends up shooting brent so you're like okay well no loss there in my personal opinion um so yeah, he ends up tripping after he shoots Brent, um, telling them all to get away from him. He ends up like sliding down the wall because he's having a total mental breakdown. When all of a sudden Brent comes from around the corner, it's like you weren't a good shot. 
and like puts like a fire poker thing like right through his brain like right through his eye very nice kill um gets him through the eye gets the gun again uh tries to kill mike and jen uh chases them into the basement where amber is also down there amber is in the basement what does he do he's got he's got jennifer and mike like after this nice little chase scene he gets them like cornered right and he's going to like hey i win i'm going to kill you and um you didn't see it coming but amber's down there right and amber's got issues of her own but she's down there and right when he starts to shoot mike and jen she bashes him over the skull with a shovel and it goes down she then continues to bash him very very ugly crushes his skull she's just like taking out all of her frustration she's also hooked on a an anti-anxiety pill that she hasn't been able to take so yeah <laughs> she goes to town on his head with a panic attack and a shovel so it's pretty it's pretty nasty um so now we're down to just those three she goes back upstairs um yeah she smashes him with a shovel she goes back upstairs now this is where because mike and jen have the guns again right have the gun again well amber is like finally gets to go take a pill you know clonopin xanax something uh her anxiety medicine so she goes to her purse and opens it up and she's like all like oh thank god i finally get to take a pill instead there's a note in there and it's like no more pills try this instead and it's a gun so now she has a gun uh, that was in her purse the three of them kind of face off um jen ends up shooting amber however in the basement again when she goes back down there to face off with them jen then surprises lee um wasn't amber dead yeah she shoots her dad no okay see i tried to get ahead of myself so amber's laying there she's shot jennifer turns around and this you did not see coming because why would they do that i mean they were like the closest of all of them right she just surprisingly guts him with a big butcher knife and you're like what the fuck did that come from you know so she stabs mike and he ends up falling up against the wall and is sitting there bleeding out uh she surprisingly stabs mike yeah and distracts uh amber distracts her because amber's not quite dead people never really finish you off do they in these movies make sure they're dead before you move on that's my opinion you know that would be my motto in a slasher it's like don't just kill them and think you've killed them make sure they're dead before you move on to plan to the next plan that's that's just my advice if you're ever in that situation so she ends up jumping jennifer they have a nice big cat fight where amber ends up killing jennifer so it's like things are not going the way that you think they go in this movie you know you're like oh she's going to be the end oh he's going to be the end oh she's going to win and they keep they keep like tripping you up which i kind of enjoyed um, because i thought amber was dead just like i thought brett was dead then brett films caddy uh kills freddie and you're like what the fuck i didn't see that and then you know it, it just kind of goes like that i did not see amber going to bash his skull in while screaming about all of her angst about who she loves and who doesn't and cheating on her and stuff you know aggression can come out all that stuff you're keeping inside in a situation like this what you, you know 
what your friend did to you five years ago when they slept with your boyfriend or something, it's going to come out in a situation like this. That's always interesting in these movies. You keep shit, oh, we made up. Yeah, we made up until we're in a life or death situation. Then I'm going to remind you of you sleeping with my boyfriend five years ago while I kill you because now I have an excuse. Remember that next time you fuck over a friend as well. So, Amber ends up managing to kill Jennifer. For real. <laughs> and then she goes up and is like, to Mike and is like, you know, I don't know what we're going to do. I think her plan was let the motherfucker come. Because as you can imagine, it's like 557. So it's like tick tock, tick tock. And Amber and Mike are the only ones left sitting there. And he's gutted. Um, but obviously savable. She's kind of, you know, she's shot. She's a little rough for wear herself. Um, and they know that the killer's coming in. And I think that what Amber wanted to do was just wait for him and face off with him. You know, but Mike has a different plan. And that is that he grabs her hand, you know, because she's holding that knife. She's waiting for the killer and they hear him coming. And he grabs her hand and like a good little sacrificial boy. He stabs himself with it and like dies at the clock at the, the stroke of six and the killer comes down and, you know, uh, tells her that, you know, they have their little thing. Killer comes, Mike takes her hand, stabs himself. She tells him that she has a little secret for him. She understands what he was doing, you know, seeing whether other people would make the same choices that he did when he killed his friends to save his life. She says, I get it, but here's a little secret for you. This doesn't prove anything except you were already crazy before you killed your friends, which is how you were able to kill your friends. It's a little thing you may not have thought about. So she sort of gets the the last word on him by insulting him that way. And she's like, he's like, whatever. You have to live with what I have to live with now. And kind of leaves. So the next thing that you see is the phone ringing at that doctor's office. You know, the doctor that let him out of the psych ward who's had, you know, these years of, of arguing this stuff with him. So he lets him, you, you see him get a, a phone call, but he doesn't answer. So uh, the killer leaves a voicemail that was like, um, you know, you always told me that I had other options and that other people would not do what I did and I'm a bad person for what I did. And I just want you to know that your son helped me prove my theory. And then you zoom in. Because while this message is being left, it's kind of zooming around the doctor's room and you see him and his wife. But then you see him and his son. And it's Brent. Now, Brent was the asshole of the bunch. Brent was the one who was, did the most killing. And so when you saw that picture of the doctor and Brent, you know why he chose that cabin. You know why he chose that group of people. He went after his son and made his son do exactly what he did and kill a bunch of his friends. So... You know, he said that your son helped prove my theory, and that equals closure. And then it goes off. So that's the way the movie ends, and I really, really love this movie. I also like the, the special features on this movie contained two alternate endings. I mean, not alternate endings, alternate intros. And what was cool about it is that you can often find deleted scenes 
on. I mean, it's usually part of all special features in all movies. But this one, I think, was so interesting because each special, each deleted scene was accompanied by an introduction by the director, Chris Moore. And these things were really cool because not only did he explain, you know, this is what they are. These are the original introductions to this movie, the opening scenes. But after we had filmed them, we decided later on that, because at the beginning when we filmed this movie, we wanted him to have been playing this game with other people before this group. But then during filming, I kind of decided that I wanted this to be his first time and be completely a theory because of what he had done. So he, he cut out all that time. So you got to see these opening kills. Um, it was a, a guy and a, it was a guy and another guy, their kill scene, which was really good. And then th that same guy and a girl and their kill scene, which was really good. So I really enjoyed the fact that it didn't just have deleted scenes, but it had deleted scenes in which the director actually explained to you why they were filmed. This is the way the movie was going. We decided not to do it that way. These are the scenes. Um, and, um, you know, to get an explanation of why they were cut out. They were cut out because... Originally, in this movie, this guy, this particular group of people were going to be killed way later. And that in the meantime, he had done it to other groups of people. But then they decided to scrap that and just make this group the first group that he attacked to get back at the doctor. So you got to see those scenes. And those were really good. And I, I do agree with him. Because I think I'd heard someone kind of say that this movie had a little saw, was a little, had a little saw in it as far as the reasoning behind it. I think if it had made him playing this game more than this first time, it would have made it even more closer to the reasoning behind the saw movie. So I kind of like that. But the scenes are there. You get to see these really two good kills. Um, what he did to that girl was horrible, you know, from that the first group. And um, so you got to basically see three people of the first group. But that's all they filmed because then they decided not to do it that way. <coughs> but um, those were really cool deleted scenes. So, yeah. I gave this movie an 8 out of 10. I really love this. I know I I said it before. I think someone called it a Saw ripoff. And I'm like, I'm sorry, it's not. Um, just because a movie has a protagonist or a villain, a nemesis, just because a movie has a nemesis who is teaching lessons or working on theories or getting revenge doesn't mean that, you know, I hate to tell you, but I spit on your grave was a hell of a long time before Saw. So coming up with games and puzzles and engaging in murderous theories was, you know, that existed in movies before Saw. So just because this guy set a couple of traps was just a couple and this whole group basically slasher killed each other i just don't really see it that much as saw just because you had a guy trying to prove a point because that's all saw is so i think that because of the popularity of saw or the um, propagation of saw with there being 10 movies and everybody knows they exist i think that often a lot of movies are um, compared to Saul, when Saul wasn't the first one that ever did this, you know what I'm saying? 
And this movie only had those two traps, you know. They but he he had the 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 tire strip to keep him from leaving with the van. And he had that one bear trap that the guy stepped in. Everybody else killed everybody else. He did not kill anyone actually except for Nicole, that very first girl. When she refused to shoot uh Carlos, that's the only person he killed. He didn't kill Alex. Brent did that. Brent killed Freddy. Brent tried to kill the rest of them. Amber killed Jennifer. Um, Jennifer shot Amber. Carlos, what? Oh, no, yeah. No, he killed. Yeah, that's right. The killer did kill Carlos outside the van. But they are the ones who chose Carlos and put him out there. To get shot. So, kind of habsies there. They were all the ones who killed Carlos. But especially the killer and Brent. But anyway, you see what I'm saying. Not every movie that has a protagonist who's like, I'm making you play a game, is Saul. It's just not. I guess Saul might be the most obvious. But, you know, not every movie that has a protagonist playing games. You know, Battle Royale was released in 2000. So, the Battle Royale genre is always got somebody playing a fucking game. That's the whole point. Doesn't make it so. Anyway, that's Kill Theory. Day 5. Part of the 8 films to die for Horror Fest 4 collection. I absolutely love this movie. It's a great cabin by the lake slasher. A lot of slasher kills. It's really good. And I will see you in the next one. Love you, miss you. Bye-bye. Always remember and never forget, you are a very special person, even if you are not trapped in a cabin by a psycho who's making you kill all of your friends to prove a point. Bye-bye.